I have a story to tell you about how good God, uh, how God, how good God is, and how much He loves each one of us. I will tell you the end of my story first. On June the 12th, 2012, the Lord blessed me with a new physical heart. I haven't felt this good in at least 30 years. I was born with a genetic heart disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a heart disease that is fairly new to doctors. It was only first diagnosed in 1958 by a pathologist in London. That is only 55 years ago. It causes progressive thickening in the heart muscle and impairs blood flow. It is the most common inherited disease of the heart. It, it occurs in one in 500 people. It is the most common identifiable cause of death in young people. Also, the leading cause of death in competitive athletes. Sudden death occurs in about 1% of the, of the people diagnosed and is frequently the only uh, symptom. It is passed from parent to child without skipping a generation. I had a four in one chance of having it. For me, it came through my father's family. His mother died at 68. He died at 48. I'm one of seven children, five boys and two girls. I'm the second to the youngest. All of my brothers are gone. Each of them had heart problems. One of them, we know for sure, had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because his daughter was diagnosed with the disease. He was only 33 when he left us. It's caused by mutation of genes that are involved in the structure of the heart muscle. However, it can sometimes seem as though it skips generations. Some family members will inherit the genetic mutation but have very mild or even no health problems. 25% of patients with this disease may have detectable heart murmur. That was how I felt I was first diagnosed. A doctor who read one of my echocardiograms picked it up at, a, at its very early stage. This was in the early 90s. I was told that although I was only 40, I had an old person's heart. I always enjoyed being active. Hiking and gardening were very enjoyable to me. Before I was diagnosed, I would get out of breath doing this kind of activity. I thought I was just out of shape. I realize now it, it didn't matter how much I exercised. It was my sick heart. My son so far does not show any signs of it, but he is supposed to get checked every five years. <laughs> <laughs> As for Sandy, she was another blessing that came to us in another way. In 2002, I had open heart surgery. They shaved off some of the heart and repaired a, a valve. I expected to bounce back and be as good as new. Things were a little bit better, but I still got short of breath with exertion. There were lots and lots of tests and hospital stays with me only getting worse. During one of those hospital stays, Jesus gave me one of the, my doctors that I had a lot of trouble liking in the past. Well, God changed my mind about him and gave me opportunities to talk to him about the Lord. The doctor started talking about heart transplant. Tom and I were shocked at this. I did not feel I was ready for something so drastic. By March 2012, I was basically in or close to in stage of my heart disease. The blood flow was very restricted, and a lot of fluid had built up around it. The doctor brought up transplant again. I, of course, was ready to say, no way. When I asked him how long will I have with the heart I was born with, he said at most five years. This put a different light on it. As you know, Tom and I have two wonderful grand, excuse me, grandkids and I wanted to be able to see them become adults. So right then I prayed and asked Jesus to take control 
to let me know what he wanted me to do. I said, all right, knowing there were lots of tests to be, still to be done or doors for him to close before I could be put on the list. One of the reasons they thought I was a good candidate was uh, for the list was even though my heart was very sick, the rest of my body was healthy. God had kept it that way. With how sick my heart was, the rest of my body should have started to shut down. One of the concerns going on the list is the financial burdens that transplants can place on families. There are many families that have to hold fundraisers to raise support for the surgery or medi and medications. We met with the financial representative for the transplant team. He assured us that the insurance that I had was ample to meet the need with some reasonable co-payments. I took this as another sign from the Lord because if I had been told that I had to do a fundraiser for myself, then it would be his way of telling me, no, I don't do fundraisers. <laughs> By the end of March 2012, I got word that I was on the list. The list is made up of 1A for the hospitalized very sick, 1B for very sick but doesn't need to be hospitalized, and number two, active on the list. This was where I was placed. The word went out to everyone we knew that had a prayer life. Thank you, church family, for being part of that group. Near the end of May, the doctors decided that things were getting bad, and because they couldn't do what they can with regular congestive heart failure patients, they would try to get me raised up on the list. The United States is made up of zones for the transplant list. Our zone includes seven states. For me to be raised, on the raised up on the list, the doctors had to petition the board made up of one person from each of the seven states. They had 48 hours to respond, and we needed four out of the seven to say yes. On Monday, June the 11th, I got a call from my transplant coordinator saying I was moved from a 2 to a 1B. They had gotten six out of the seven responses to say yes. The seventh was never heard from. It was arranged that the next day, she would call me back with an appointment for my next clinic visit. She did call the next day. She asked what I was doing and I told her my grandkids and I were watching the end of the car movie. She told me to get to the hospital right away. They had a heart for me. My reaction was shock. It's like having a baby for the first time. You know, you know it's going to happen, but it's, what do I do? What do I do? I, 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 made, the, I, I made phone calls. I got the phone calls I had to make got Tom and Eric home from work, one to take me to the hospital, the other to take care of the kids. We had been told where to go in the hospital. When we walked in to the unit, the person who greeted us could not believe I was the patient. They said, our patients come in wheelchairs, not walking. I met my nurse and about four men standing around with shocked looks on their faces. I told them they were not giving me a lot of confidence. <laughs> I still don't know why they were there. The nurse got them out of the room and me in bed. I don't remember much of anything after that. Eventually, I came to my senses. Spent my life, or spent my time in the cardiac ICU, quoting scripture to myself and calling on the name of Jesus. The scripture that I relied on most was Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God blessed me with great doctors, nurses, etc. Even the young woman who cleaned the floor, they were great, only the best for his children. They all got to hear how good the Lord is. After a week, they deemed me ready to go to the next recovery unit. Everyone there was wonderful also. 
I was only supposed to be in the hospital for 10 days. As things go, the Lord had a different plan. I was there 25 days. They would say, you are going home on a certain day. The Lord would, through what I came to call a bump in the road, tell them, not today. My new heart was having trouble settling into its new home. I knew I was not ready to go home yet. When the time came, I was ready and the Lord was ready. I told Tom on a Friday, I'm going home. He was afraid to tell me that at lunchtime he ran into my doctor, who's been taking care of my heart for at least the last 18 years. He tells Tom, I'll have to stay until Monday. Well, God had a different plan. The transplant team met and he was outvoted. Once at home, there were ups and downs, but we got through it. In the first week of November, I started 36 weeks of cardiac rehab. This was a great blessing to me. I have a lot of my strength back. I am even able to climb hills without having to stop and give my breath. The Lord has a reason for this extra time he has given me. He has chased the enemy from my door more than once. He has, he has a plan, and I know I'm ready to let him lead the way. He has given me this miracle of a new young heart, and now I'm trying to get the rest of my body up to speed. We go to the gym. <laughs> there are some things that are bumps in the road, such as anti-rejection meds, they mess with the white blood cells, so don't be offended when I don't shake your hand. And also, the heart valve, a heart valve was damaged during one of the early biopsies. I have had 14 biopsies so far with zero rejection. The Lord is good. He will take care of those bumps as he did the others. I just had to do my part. I just want to tell you one other thing that I don't have written down here. They, they did tell me it was a nice young heart, and it turned out, this is how good the Lord is, it turned out that the donor was in the next operating room from me. So the heart didn't even have to travel. You talk about how good the Lord is. Although I'm grateful and thankful that Jesus has given me this extra time, I can't help but remember that through all this, someone died. My prayer when I was on the list was that the donor would have opportunities to come to know Jesus, that we would, pr would meet one day in heaven. We will praise the Lord together. It's heartbreaking to think of that family who has lost their loved one. They need prayer also. God could have given me a healthy heart from birth. Instead, he allowed me to have a defect that he can use to make me into the believer of character he wants me to be. He is using this problem for good in my life. I hope that I'm learning from all the pain of all this. I know God is in control and his will is being accomplished. On June the 12th, I celebrated one year since I received this blessing. It, did not, it is not over, I still go for all-day visits to the hospital, where they do lots of tests to make sure things are as they should be. I had to have some spots on my skin removed. It's a very minor type of skin cancer. With the anti-rejection meds, my body has no way of fighting things like this. Jesus did not bring me to this point to have me have to deal with cancer. He has it all under control, and I will trust him in it all. I know he wants me to take precautions to do my best to stay healthy. It is just using common sense. Please take the step to become an organ donor. Remember, it's the ultimate recycling. <laughs> When Roseanne spoke about uh, that she didn't know what was going on after uh, they put her in bed uh, before she went for the operation, 
Well, the four of us, we all were in the room with her and, and talking with her and praying. Now, that includes the pastor. He was, he was fantastic through this all. And at approximately 10.30, uh, they rolled her down to the operating room. And the doctor told us, you're not going to hear from us until this is all over. So we had one heck of a night. <laughs> at 5.30 a.m., the doctor came to see us, and he said, well, she, everything went well, and uh, someone will come out to you when you can go see her. Well, that took another two hours. But uh, they finally came at 7 o'clock, and they brought us uh, into her room. Now, she wasn't awake or anything like that, she was st but she was breathing. And they told us, you know, uh, you guys have spent a heck, one heck of a night. In fact, it was probably one of the worst nights of my life. But uh, the Lord brought us through it. The Lord was with us. And at that time, I just trusted in him when they said, why don't you guys all go home and get some rest? And so that's what we did until later on that day. But from that day, it seemed like there were, uh, it was a lot of days that she was in that hospital. And, uh, you know, they were rough ones, but we got through it. And again, the Lord is the one that helped us get through it. And through it all, now that I look back on it, I can say, if it wasn't for him, we'd have never made it through. I just want to thank and praise the Lord. Um, through this whole experience, I keep asking God, you know, what am I learning here? And um, the biggest thing was is faith in trusting his timing. Um, for those that don't know, um, we all live in one house, not Jeffrey, but uh, Eric, my, sorry, sweetie, uh, but Eric and the kids and I um, and mom and dad all share a home. We have the in-law apartment, um, and so, and part of that was because of the journey that has been my mom's health. Uh, we've spent 30 years consumed by this issue, and um, so, you know, she mentioned that I came to them in a different way. Um, this journey really started in 1970 for me um, when they adopted me as a baby. So, um, and mom and I are <laughs> the best of friends. So, um, and a lot of this is, I've had the blessing of being able to care for her through all of this when my dad and my brother just, you know, it's a woman thing, right? <laughs> giving her her shots and, you know, all that other stuff. Um, I've played a lot of nursemaid in the last 30 years while also raising two children. So, um, you know, we know that the Lord's timing was perfect, and just having me a part of their family was a lot. So I could be there for this journey with them. Um, and for the timing, as soon as we knew, you know, my heart was scared to death when they started talking about transplant because the surgery she had in 2002 was rather traumatic for her. And I'm like, Eric and I would talk all the time, but she's not going to do it. She's not going to do it. I know she's not going to do it. She said they'll never open her up again or she's not going to do it. And God gave her the courage and the strength to say yes and to agree to go on the list. And um, again, just miracles left and right. Um, and the timing of it, you know, Eric used to be the manager down at the Westview Park Vale, for those of you that bank there. Um, and Park Vale got taken over by First National, and there's a First National right on center, so you can't have two branches a block from each other. So his branch was closed, and he was shipped out to Monroeville when all of this was kind of transpiring. And I told him, I said, honey, she's not going to go in for the surgery until you're back in the North Hills. This is not going to happen. So late March, early April, he got transferred back to McKnight and Siebert. So he was five minutes from the house again <laughs> to be near the kids because I work in East Liberty. Um, so that came to fruition. Um, and then when the call came, we were actually scheduled to go to Williamsburg that Friday. 
uh, mom couldn't be more than two hours from home, so we invited my mother-in-law, and Eric and the kids and I were shipped out, getting ready to go. And the call came. So this was Tuesday and Wednesday, and Friday was vacation, and I knew that I needed time to recharge because what was going to happen when I got back to help care for her when she was discharged from the hospital. Um, but when she finally came to on Thursday and we were kind of talking about it, she was on medications that made her highly anxious. She wasn't our mom, really. Um, and so we were talking about it and she said, well, you can't go. I was like, okay, really, mom, really? No, you can't go. No, you have to stay with me, I need you here. Oh, okay, mom, okay. So I got, went home that night and packed anyways. <laughs> and I'm like, it's the meds, it's the meds, it's the meds. Um, got Eric and the kids and my mother-in-law all set to go, and Friday morning I kissed them all goodbye and sent them on their way, and I packed my car and went to the hospital. Um, and got there, what are you doing here? You told me I wasn't allowed to go. No, you need to go. You need to go recharge. And <laughs> so I hung out till about lunchtime and then floored it to Williamsburg. Um, <laughs> stopped for one pit stop and had food and everything. So, so, I mean, God's timing was perfect. And it was just the recharge that I needed to come back and, and to be with her and help care for her. Um, and my job, I'm blessed with a job that afforded me some at-home time that I could work from home on my computer and um, to be there in the afternoons with her and, and my son. Um, they are, they take care of my kids. So this year has been a challenge. Um, in October, Eric made the decision to leave First National and join another company that in the process folded. Wow. So he's been out of work since October and um, has been able to be there for the kids while mom continues to get strengthened and do the rehab. And um, God has blessed him with not just one job offer, but two, so, um, which he's taken, and um, he starts next Monday. So God has just blessed us and provided for us, and um, again, his timing. There's, I, I can't, it floors me every time I think about it, just how everything laid out, um, and has just been perfect. And I did this in the first service, and he told me I didn't have to, but um, I'm going to thank Chris again, because I like when his head goes red. Um, <laughs> that's how you know he's embarrassed, um, <laughs> the chrome dome. Um, but <laughs> he's an excellent husband and father, and he is a father to all of us. And if you've not had the opportunity to have him shepherd you, um, I pray that none of you ever need him to the level that we did. Um, but he was there. He kept me in touch while I was in Williamsburg. There was some rough spots while I was away, and that's all I could think about. And he went to be with my dad. Just, you know, um, he knows way more about the Zader Sturgaleskin clan than he probably ever wants to know, TMI. Um, but, um, you know, we consider him really part of our family. And... I really hope you all know how much this man loves you all.